The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. Good evening and welcome to this special presentation. And as we all know, the global pandemic has affected most of the economies around the globe and all nations worldwide are struggling to get back on pace to stabilize their economies. So today on the show, we are going to talk about the apparel industry per se in Sri Lanka, because that is one of the main industries which were affected and it's one of the largest export industries here in Sri Lanka. And also the ILO and the IFC has collaborated with each other and they're planning to launch a program called Better Work here in Sri Lanka. And to discuss that, we have uh, Simring Singh, who is the country director of the ILO, and also to discuss about the concept of why Sri Lanka, why not, in order to bring Sri Lanka into a more resilient and a more competitive state, we have the Ambassador Dennis Chaibi from the European Union and Ambassador Tanya Kunkrip from the Kingdom of Netherlands. Thank you very much for taking the time to join me on the show today and I believe that this discussion is going to be very helpful in terms of making people aware about the apparel industry and developing this even further. So I would like to pose my first question to you. Now, during this time of dismay with the pandemic hit economies, why do you think that this is the time that we should talk about this concept? Why Sri Lanka? Why not? Simring, if you could start. <laughs> sure. I think as we're emerging from this pandemic, uh, employment and job-rich recovery is at the core of this. And not just job-rich recovery, but a human-centered recovery. So when things were not structurally going well, even pre-pandemic, we see this as an opportunity now for us to be able to build back and build back in better ways, knowing what works and what doesn't work. And there could be no other industry than the apparel one as a good starting point here in Sri Lanka. As you know already, there are more than 300,000 people working in the export-oriented garment sector, apparel industry. But that number might seem small. Actually, as many as 1 million people were employed in the associated services associated with this industry. So that's 1 million people in Sri Lanka already that had their source of employment, many of whom are women. And we know building back better means and a human-centered recovery means that women need to be also very much part of the labor force and performing. So in that sense, I think, you know, building on the capital, building on the already pretty good reputation of the Sri Lankan apparel industry and knowing how many jobs it can create. How can we now make it even better, a better source of income, be it more competitive and also one that actually can boast of the kind of gender equality that needs to happen and the kind of workplace cooperation that needs to happen to solve problems and, and deal with them and do even better. Uh, Ambassador Dennis, if you could add on to that as well. Yeah, I, if you look at Europe, where um, I come from, um, there are two things that go in, in, in the way that has been described. First of all, women have uh, suffered more from the pandemic than men. Why? Because with uh, closed schools and staying at home, who did most of the work? It's women. So there's been more pressure. And combined with that, during, after the pandemic, if you look at Europe, US and elsewhere, People have been a bit shaken by the experience say, if I don't like a job, I'm not going to stay. And that's why you have a bit of an inflation and things. People want to be attracted by better jobs and people have to compensate with other means. But if you see the pressure that has been put on women, plus the fact that many people now want to change jobs, that's where social standards and ILO action is very primordial for the industry to keep and enhance the status of women in, in, in that garment. Ambassador Tanya, is there anything that you would like to add on to this as well? No, I think my colleagues said it very well, yes. Uh, in your opinion, where do you think Sri Lanka's apparel industry stands right now with the global pandemic taking place? How do you think Sri Lanka is faring? Well, um, I think um, Sri Lanka um, <laughs> Is, is trying hard, but we have to try harder. Um, and if we focus on the, um, the apparel industry, um, you see that there are different forces um, there. Um, on the one hand, um, as we said, um, the, the, the sector and especially the SMEs are hit hard by the, 
by COVID, by the pandemic. Uh, on the other hand, there was already work to do. Um, Sri Lanka was actually a very good example and has been a good example in the apparel industry, at least certain brands by initiatives like um, Garment Without Guilt. Um, and I think that there is an opportunity to really take this to the next level um, with the bigger brands, but also definitely in the SME sector. And that's why I think it's so important um, uh, that we also take this, this sector uh, on board. All right, thank you. Uh, something that I picked up when you said Simran was that most of the women working in the apparel, in, uh, employees working in the apparel industry are women. And I would like to agree on that probably around 65 to 70 percent of them are women. And most of them are operators or helpers. But when you take the hierarchy and consider only the top level management, we don't see an equal amount of women and men in there. Is there a particular reason why this is happening and what do you think that we should do as a country, as organizations, in order to promote more women joining or moving up the corporate ladder? Yeah, indeed. Actually, it's, it's quite disappointing in our view that such a large female workforce and, and so few, if any, at the supervisory level. And this is where the ILO's work in other countries, including through this Better Work program, has actually demonstrated that having more women in supervisory roles actually makes the profits higher, makes the actual companies more competitive as well. Uh, I think there was like a 22% uh, increase in competitiveness and profitability as a result of having more women in supervisory roles. And this is really, really essential for the industry to take seriously and do immediately. Because not only does it increase profitability and competitiveness, uh, it ensures safer workplaces which are very important, free of harassment. Um, and, and we saw a reduction of 17% in harassment in these places, um, which is quite significant. Uh, even the gender pay gap actually reduced significantly as a result of this. So there's a lot of pluses that can actually come about from in ensuring that there are more women in supervisory positions. There has to be definitely steps taken in terms of career progression uh, for women in the industry and uh, so that they can move up the ladder and be representative and represent the voice of other female workers in, in the workforce. I think culturally this is the issue. Culturally you have a demographic of women that basically enter the workforce and leave at age 25 just as they've become childbearing age. So certainly childcare uh, assistance is also an area uh, that would help retain women and make it more attractive. Um, a safer workplace, better wages, uh, career progression, childcare, um, and, and a space to be able to talk about issues and resolve them. I think all of those things, if they can happen, uh, really does lead to good results. As I said, 22% increase in profitability is pretty attractive. Yes. Uh, now, comparing to the previous years, do you see an improvement in this industry? Do you th see an improvement of, you know, companies or organizations or the government taking steps in order to improve this compared to the previous years? Um, Yes, because uh, the Better Work program has been something uh, they have agreed to, and I'm really pleased that uh, the government, the unions, and also the employers' uh, organization, including the industry association, have come together very proactively uh, to be part of this Better Work program, which is a global flagship program of the ILO. In all countries we know, the big garment producing uh, countries, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, including several Sri Lankan companies that have their footprint in Jordan and, and uh, Ethiopia, etc. So by agreeing and, and being proactive to come um, and join this program and to agree to the kind of social standards it's going to bring and the workplace improvements, I think it's, it's a very good step and it's not too late. It's actually a very very good time as we build back from the pandemic. And also uh, it's related to trade and also bettering human rights, uh, whether it's women's rights and, and their empowerment and also checking the boxes on showing that you're doing well and you're doing stellar. <laughs> All right, Ambassador Dennis, now as we all discussed, the apparel industry is playing a major role in generating income and also employment to the citizens here in Sri Lanka. According to statistics, uh, around 330,000, as you mentioned, uh, have been given jobs and that's almost about 5% of the total. And the apparel industry is one of the main export markets here in Sri Lanka. Now, in order to 
uh, for Sri Lanka to become more competitive and resilient, what actions do you think that we should take? Well, in terms of resilience, I think uh, that um, Sri Lanka can show one or two things to the world. It has survived a civil war, a tsunami, Easter bomb attacks, and now financial crisis. So in terms of resilience, I have faith in Sri Lankan people. In terms of competitiveness, um, there are perhaps three ways that uh, Sri Lanka uh, apparel industry, but the government at large, uh, can look at. The first one is to keep GSP+. Plus. Uh, GSP Plus provides a competitive advantage by reducing the, the, the tariffs um, and there the government has uh, received clear messages from the EU on how to keep GSP Plus and we welcome uh, the commitment of the government to achieve these steps that uh, they've committed to. The second thing is uh, to really uh, keep uh, the competitive advantage that Sri Lanka has in terms of social achievements. You know, Sri Lanka is doing better, the garment industry is doing better than its counterparts in other surrounding countries in South Asia. Um, and, it re and it gets the rewards for that. It, it is higher on the value chain because people know that they won't have reputational damage because there are ILO standards that are uh, uh, more prominent here than elsewhere. It's not perfect, but it is above the regional standards. The third um, is to attract more foreign direct investment. If you want the garment industry to be on a sustainable course, it needs to get investment and investment. And foreign may help uh, uh, partly because they will bring you know, more techniques, more uh, information and data on what is required to keep accessing the thing. So investment, standard, uh, labor organization standards, and uh, GSP+. Plus. All right, and that's it. Yes. Yeah, and maybe well, to re reiterate also definitely the second point. Um, indeed, the standards are higher, and sometimes it is seen as a disadvantage because wages are higher, and so the costs of, of production are, are, are higher. Um, and I think that it's up to 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 the, the the brands here to actually turn this into an advantage and to say, okay, this might be the case, but we are the ones that can actually um, offer clothes that are produced um, responsibly and sustainably. And I think, I mean, it's partly already done. I mentioned uh, Garments Without Guilt, uh, but I find it has been a bit silent here. So there's really an opportunity for Sri Lanka to brand itself as the preferred sustainable choice, especially for um, uh, European countries, where you see that the demand for responsibly and sustainably um, produced uh, garment is, is, uh, is increasing. All right, thank you for that. I think uh, this was our first segment and I think we got an idea about where Sri Lanka stands now in terms of the apparel industry and what we need to do as a country in order to build this, uh, build back better. So with that, we'll have to go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon. You're watching the special presentation. Welcome back to the special presentation and I think in the first segment we discussed about where Sri Lanka is right now considering the apparel industry and what we can do as a country to build this industry better and develop this industry. So with that we are in discussion with the country director of ILO Simran Singh and also the ambassador Dennis Chaibi from uh, European Union, ambassador Tangna Kung, uh, Kung Krip from the Kingdom of Netherlands. Uh, my next que first question would be to you Simran now the apparel industry takes its pride in itself and you know it's it's flourishing in Sri Lanka and it's one of the main export markets what do you think we should do in order to make this a more preferred sourcing destination right um, it does enjoy a better reputation than many of the neighbors as was said earlier as well um, and it should certainly build on that uh, there are some areas it does need to work on a bit uh, further um, in terms of adhering to international labor standards and the ILO standard set for decent work. Um, by and large, it has uh, many of those aspects, but things like non-discrimination, again, we were talking about women, not having women in, in you know, a higher level positions, it could work on making that happen. Uh, there's also issues related to uh, no um, 
avenues for workers and employers to dialogue and discuss and actually deal with uh, grievances, for example, that take place at the factory floor or whatever associated. So a space for this kind of negotiations, a healthy space doesn't always exist, and this is an area that they could, which is a, a standard that's important. Um, wages are, are better than most other countries, but you know that's also an area that could be could be looked at. Better safety and health measures is another area, uh, including very importantly uh, focusing, especially now in the COVID times, uh, you know, on the mental health. Um, and well-being side of things. That that's an area, when we look at occupational safety and health, we look at airing things out and spacing, but we might not think about the actual psychological elements that are dealing, many of the workers have to deal with. So it's, uh, the, working on the safety and health, uh, improvements on that aspect is very important. But one of uh, the issues that I think that, you know, when we think of the apparel industry, we think of these wonderful uh, large companies and factories that are in export processing zones. The thing is that when a European consumer, any consumer, frankly, uh, or brands are looking to source from Sri Lanka, the reputation of the entire industry uh, is at stake, which means that it's not just saying, oh, in that factory it's okay, or in that export processing zone, it's the whole ecosystem. And so many people in Sri Lanka currently are employed and are making garments or apparel outside of those factories. And there's actually not much information available on what are the subcontracting arrangements between what is happening at the export factory versus what's happening outside in rural areas uh, where this is being you know, produced or in, in the semi-urban areas. And we know many women, small outfits, these micro small enterprises in particular, their source of income is is through the apparel uh, sector. And they tend to compete with each other, unfortunately, and don't get very many returns as well. So I think for Sri Lanka, it shouldn't just be about, we're just gonna look at the export zones, but we need to really focus on those micro small enterprises that are creating so much employment as well, and have potential to actually increase, for example, volume of, of products and also sourcing of certain things that could be locally sourced as opposed to, you know, the difficulties also being faced in terms of sourcing certain essential items uh, from uh, outside at these days. So I think really a focus on the subcontracting micro small enterprises uh, to complement, of course, these wonderful, these important uh, steps in terms of safety and health, uh, non-discrimination, uh, space to have a dialogue uh, and negotiate, I think that would uh, really take this industry and, and brand Sri Lanka, brand Sri Lanka up top. Right, Simran. So now since you mentioned the SMEs, the small medium enterprises, uh, uh, Ambassador Tani, I would like to pose the next question to you. If I'm not mistaken, the Dutch government is supporting the Gampa district to develop their SMEs in that area. So in your perspective, uh, what do you think that these little SMEs can contribute in developing Sri Lanka's economy? Well, as in any economy, also in Sri Lanka, SMEs are the backbone of, of, of the economy. So they're hugely important. And you see it also in the, in, in the numbers. And we mentioned around 330,000 jobs in the apparel uh, sector and about 20,000, I understand, are employed in the SME sector. So these are many people that uh, need to make a living uh, and um, a, a better living than they do now. So I think it's very important. Two reasons why we should um, support this and why we are supporting this, this project in, in Gampa. The first one, it's all mentioned, uh, um, but the World Bank has also found that um, especially SMEs have been hit really, really hard. Uh, by the COVID pandemic. So um, that's an important reason why we also look at SMEs uh, because they're so important. And the second reason is that, um, uh, and that was actually also mentioned by, by my colleague Simrin, that we have to look at health and safety circumstances also uh, in SMEs. And let me elaborate a little bit on that because um, we've seen um, quite a lot of activity also in the Netherlands and other European countries um, to make value chains, including the, uh, the ready-made garment or apparel sector, more sustainable. Uh, it really got um, an extra push after the terrible accident in, uh, in Bangladesh in 2013, the collapse of Rana Plaza, which 
took over 1,100 lives. And that really um, encouraged uh, several actors to take more responsibility. Um, what happened in the Netherlands is that um, um, the government, together with uh, brands and retailers, the trade unions um, and also NGOs, um, signed an agreement in the Netherlands that they would work together. It's called an RBC, a Responsible Business Conduct Agreement, that they would work together to make the value chains in the apparel sector more sustainable. So in the Netherlands, they would reach out to their partners in uh, producing countries like Bangladesh, like uh, Pakistan, like uh, Sri Lanka, and um, the government would work together on labor laws and um, uh, labor inspection, the, the strengthening the labor inspections. Uh, NGOs, uh, trade unions would, would work together with their counterparts, and um, the retailers and the brands, they uh, made a promise to and, and committed themselves, it's legally binding, to source more responsibly and to also make that possible. Because if we don't take this this um, uh, this challenge, uh, if you don't regard it as a common responsibility, uh, we won't solve this. I mean, this is larger than just the factories here and um, definitely larger than, than the SMEs here. Um, this um, incident, this terrible accident in Bangladesh also led to what's called the Accord. Um, that was um, an international initiative, but it was similar. Uh, it was also brands and retailers in um, uh, buying um, uh, countries uh, committing themselves to more sustainable working circumstances or more safe working uh, circumstances. And in September uh, 2021, so last year, um, there was a new accord which is called the International Accord for Health and Safety. Um, the Secretariat is actually in the Netherlands and they are expanding to other countries now. And it's actually um, being looked at whether Sri Lanka could also become part of this international accord uh, in which a lot of brands and retailers have committed to a more sustainable and um, more safe ready-made garment sector. And I'm saying this because now back to the SMEs, it means that we've been focusing a lot on the export sector, and that's what Simrion also mentioned. And it's so important to go beyond that because we've seen that there is no trickle-down effect like we hoped there would be if we would sort of bring the export sector uh, to the next level, we hope that that the the um, locally um, uh, producing um, uh, sort of factories and, and 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 the more informal sector would also come to the next level and 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 get better paid and better working circumstances. That's not happening. So we really have to focus on the SMEs, and that's what we are doing in a very um, uh, focused way uh, in Gampara. Something interesting uh, that you mentioned was that Yala considering Sri Lanka to be a part of this accord and how long do you think that this uh, would take to make this happen? Well, this is not something I, I uh, decide. Um, there's a secretariat of the international court and it's, it's based in the Netherlands, but it's not Dutch. Uh, and it's really, um, um, it really the, the secretariat is uh, empowered or mandated by the, um, the members, the brands and the retailers to, to look into the expansion and, um, and they are looking into a mission and see whether Sri Lanka could be um, one of them. Yes. All right. Ambassador Dennis, something that you mentioned earlier was the GSP plus benefits plays an important role uh, in order to deal up the exports from Sri Lanka to international nations. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the European Govern uh, Parliament is reviewing the GSP plus uh, preferential benefits right now. and. What are some of the issues that you came across within this review? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just uh, for, the, for the viewers, GSP Plus um, allows Sri Lanka exports tariff-free. In principle, any product that goes to the EU is taxed at 24% for textile, but Sri Lanka committed to GSP Plus. So, it is an advantage. It is important for the competitiveness because uh, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Philippines can export with 0% uh, to, the, to the EU. So the competitiveness of Sri Lanka compared to these countries relies on keeping this tariff advantage. Um, there's a bit of a history. Um, um, it was withdrawn from
from uh, Sri Lanka in 2010, after the uh, end of the civil war. Um, and it was reinstated in 2017, based on the commitments of Sri Lanka to amend the PTA to improve the labor standards and environmental standards. Now, one thing that is important is that it's Sri Lanka that want that, that committed to that objective. It's not that we forced Sri Lanka to do so. We, you know, Sri Lanka is a sovereign country. The only thing is, if they want to have zero percent tariff to access our markets, these are the things they have to commit and implement. And now we're in the implementation phase. So every um, two years, the European Commission reviews uh, GSP and issue a report. In doing this job, it exchanges with the European Parliament and the Member States. So the European Parliament is not the one reviewing uh, the GSP+, Plus, but the European Parliament is the one that can put pressure on the Commission, which is accountable to the Parliament and to the Member States, to look at certain aspects. So what the European Parliament did, it asked the Commission to look at certain specific aspects of the implementation of GSP+. Plus. So these elements are the PTA, and we welcome the fact that the government uh, has now tabled the bill to review the PTA, and that it has a chance to be reviewed. It would be, if it, this happened, it would be the first time in 42 years, almost 43 years. Uh, it perhaps doesn't go as far as uh, is characterized by international standards, but it is a step in the right direction. We hope that there will be other steps. Um, it, um, the parliament asked uh, Sri Lanka to engage, Sri Lankan authorities to engage more widely with civil society so that there's more engagement, more listening to what the civil society has to, to say. Um, it asked the government to exercise some restraint regarding the task force, especially in terms of uh, archaeology uh, in the East or uh, one country, one law. Um, what is very important for, for today's oh. debate is that in the area of uh, labor relations, um, the parliament has asked to improve the implementation of ILO conventions, in particular on the freedom of association and uh, on non-discrimination. So for example, there's not a specific law on non-discrimination at work, and that is, for example, something that would be uh, highly welcome. And then to also um, ask for amendments to the critical uh, criminal justice rules, uh, in particular in relation to forced labor. Uh, people who are jailed should not be uh, in any event uh, f forced to, uh, to work, and criminalization of same-sex relations. So these are the things that are in the review of uh, the Commission, some that have been highlighted by the European Parliament, and we're in constant dialogue with the authorities. The latest was uh, on the 8th of February, uh, on the basis of which there was a joint press release that was issued, and that gives you the exact a state of our relations where we stand in the GSP Plus review. All right. We hope for a positive uh, remark on that in the future as well. I think we've come to the end of our second segment as well. Uh, let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon. You're watching the special presentation. Welcome back to the special presentation and I think in the first two segments we spoke about the apparel industry and we ended off by Ambassador Dennis telling us about the issues we are currently facing with the GSP plus benefits. Just to add on to that question, uh, would you be able to tell us a little bit about just in case, hypothetically, if Sri Lanka decides to withdraw from these benefits, what kind of impact do you think that this will have on the country? I, I don't want to speculate on possible uh, withdrawal. Um, so it's more about a basic message of uh, Sri Lanka economic uh, trajectory. Um, if the GSP plus uh, would be withdrawn, you have the net uh, diminution um, of profit because people have to pay tariffs. But it doesn't work like this in a linear manner. If you withdraw GSP plus, then um, you, it's not only that you have to pay the tariffs and that uh, diminishes your profit. It's just that you, you have uh, less possibility to export quantities as well. Because, you know, the critical mass, the trade flow, the relationship that you establish with your customer is very important. And if this gets impeded, then the impact is wider than just the margin. But there's even a wider uh, consequence. 
is that, as I, as I said before, Sri Lanka is not alone in the world. It has competitors in South Asia and Southeast Asia who are becoming very competitive, whose economic trajectory is very positive. So if Sri Lanka's reputation gets hit by the withdrawal of GSP+, Plus, then a lot of investors, including Sri Lankan investors, will look at other possibilities to invest their profit with a higher return. At the moment, the proposition of Sri Lanka for these families uh, in Sri Lanka or investors out from outside has been Sri Lanka is quality, Sri Lanka is higher social standards and will continue like that to keep a competitive advantage thanks to high social standards. If this reputation gets hit because GSP Plus is also about labor standards, then those investors from abroad or local may just go elsewhere and that would be really the detrimental impact of GSP Plus uh, withdrawal for Sri Lanka. Is there anything that you can advise on doing in order to strengthen this and make sure that these issues would be solved in the future, these little tensions? Well, I think that um, we as EU have engaged uh, with the government and, and I think that this engagement has been really positive. We are also very grateful to the garment industry to uh, uh, relay the concerns of uh, the EU in, in a constructive manner, in a way to solve it. But no, now the ball is in the court of the Sri Lankan authorities in implementing labour standards properly, in implementing environmental standards and looking at a meaningful reform of the PTA and its implementation in a way that doesn't uh, 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 um, result in uh, something that can be considered as abusive by uh, the people who are detained under the PTA. All right. My next question to you, Ambassador Tanya. Now, as we spoke about, you know, the apparel industry being flourishing in Sri Lanka and it being the main export industry here in our nation, uh, we have not seen particularly that they are doing quite well in the circular economy. Uh, how do you think that the steps that need to be taken in this industry to improve this? Well, we mentioned the, the good examples in, in sustainability and also that it can go to the next level. And circularity is definitely also part of the next uh, level. I know that a few brands are actually working on, uh, on becoming more circular and, and, and sort of taking the first steps in this area. We have organized together with the Academy of Design a workshop on circularity and circular design um, with the apparel industry. Uh, and very active participation of some of the, the bigger brands. Um, and it was very interesting, and it was actually given by a Dutch uh, organization called Circo. Um, so it is, it, there, there are developments, but these are, as I said, the first steps. And it's mostly still driven by the brands. And I think if we look at circularity, it's very important to also um, encourage research and development that is publicly accessible and maybe not limited by possibilities of intellectual uh, property. Um, so that is something we, well, we all have to look into, especially also the Netherlands, because the Netherlands is uh, aiming to have a uh, fully circular economy by 2050. Um, and that is going to be a huge challenge. We are looking into um, more sustainable uh, producing practices um, and you also need uh, innovation uh, for this. So we are very much willing to continue to share this knowledge uh, in the area of circularity and of course also to, uh, to exchange knowledge that, uh, that the, uh, the industry or different industries here um, gain um, on circularity. All right, now the next question I would like to pose it to all three of you all. Uh, now, as, as you all mentioned, Sri Lanka has a lot more to do in terms of development in the apparel industry. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, the apparel industry is making $5 billion currently. And the industry has set a target of achieving $8 billion in the year of 2025. Now, with these issues, with this current situation, with the pandemic and the disruption of the supply chain, do you think this target is practical and do you think that Sri Lanka will be able to achieve it by 2025? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I, I can go first. Go for yeah. it. <laughs> no, I, I mean, you mentioned already the, uh, the difficulties, but let me emphasize them. Uh, if the economic environment uh, uh, doesn't have forex, if it's very hard to import the raw material, 
if it's hard to repatriate profits in currencies, if it's hard to make the payments, if there are electricity cuts, all that makes it very difficult to have such a growth in such a short amount of time. Um, but to focus on the, on the positive, I think that the way markets are evolving, and it's certainly the case uh, for Europe, which is at, at that level, with this, that GDP per capita, the, the biggest market in the world, with 450 million uh, uh, inhabitants, it's, 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 it's playing into Sri Lanka's strength. It's looking at traceability of products, identification. It's looking at the footprint. Soon in the EU, products will be taxed on their carbon content. And if the carbon content has not been offset, then the tax will be uh, higher. Um, the shipping uh, may be uh, also uh, uh, considered. The waste, the waste in the process and the waste of the fabric once it reaches Europe, how it can be recycled. These are all elements that are going to uh, shape a bit the market. And there, Sri Lanka is an advantage because it's more advanced, but it has to keep that advantage. But, you know, at the end of the day, Sri Lanka is an island of 22 million inhabitants. It will never beat Bangladesh or Pakistan on price, on critical mass, on volume. The only way for Sri Lanka to move forward is on quality. Quality, 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 quality in the process, quality of the product, quality at the end of the life of the product. So Sri Lanka can really work on that strength, but for that, social standards, uh, environmental conscience will be primordial. So we, we hope that the Sri Lankan industry will continue to uh, have this uh, vision, which means that there's growth possible in the European market. Ambassador Tanya and Simran, is there anything that you all would like to add on to that question as well? Well, it also taps in in the discussion of the future of work and how um, digitalization and more technology will influence um, how work processes are organized and where they are actually organized. Um, the Netherlands used to be actually quite a, a big textile producing country, but this has all been outsourced to other countries. Uh, and there are predictions that some of the more high-tech areas will move back closer to, to some of the countries again. Um, Sri Lanka should try to be ahead of that um, development. So that is actually, I'm saying the same as my, my colleague Denise is saying, but just putting some, some emphasis on, on, on that development as well. So innovation, um, technology, um, research and development, and make sure you're <laughs> ahead of the, the wave. Um, so you remain um, uh, as a country uh, on top of these, uh, these developments and uh, you will be able to, um, to tap into these new de developments like, uh, like digitalization and, and more, more technology. So that's one thing I would, I would like to add, but maybe yeah. some... some no, I mean, I definitely following uh, this issue of quality, I have a big cue. It's really important because that's where Sri Lanka's brand is and should be, and it can be its niche, and that's what makes it more attractive to consumers and consumers and brands that would be purchasing from here. And to actually, you know, quality is not just about the fabric and the design. Quality encompasses three core principles. One is environmental sustainability, the other one is on social sustainability, and the third is on governance. Uh, those three aspects have to be checked off to make you ahead of the game so you're not racing to the bottom, but you're racing to the top. And for you to race to the top, you need to have those three areas. And I think, you know, certainly the Better Work program of the ILO, which is a flagship program, it's been in operation for over 20 years, has been assessed on all its impacts in other countries, Vietnam, and some of the statistics I gave earlier on, I mean, it is really showing results to the benefit of the, the country and the sector and to the workers, uh, because those three elements, environmental, social, and governance related aspects are, are, are covered. Um, and yes, other countries have more volume, but Sri Lanka, if you combine the actual quality orientation, the brand that it's built already, how already ahead of the game they are compared to others, I think it is, I mean, it is ambitious. 2025 is ambitious, but it's not, too far away uh, of a goal. And I think if, if the, there is a focus, if the right stakeholders come together, 
government uh, authorities, the, the industry itself, the workers that are employed, including women workers in particular, I keep emphasizing that. I think uh, there is really good potential um, bringing in all the tools of the Better Work program that have been tried and tested, you know, when it comes to workplace cooperation, a reduction in audits. Audits are extremely expensive for companies. I mean, uh, you want to move away from this audit culture nonstop, endlessly, but to actually have free-flowing and, and um, you know, reputation for actually following those social and environmental environmental and, and labor standards. So I think if we, we do that and we are open here in Sri Lanka that we have a culture of open dialogue, you know, the issues of freedom of association aren't uh, propping up uh, to cast a bad uh, reputation uh, risk to Sri Lanka. Um, where discrimination issues are not taking place, I think uh, Sri Lanka can uh, be a, a go-to and then achieve this goal of 2025. We're here to work with these stakeholders and I'm particularly grateful actually to both the EU and, and the Netherlands you know, uh, for supporting and, and being longtime partners also of the International Labour Organization and the Better Work Program. There's, they've also seen the results, I think. And so I think uh, together, you know, you don't just have uh, the local stakeholders, but you have the international community. You have the uh, ILO here working together. And, and I think we can do it together uh, if the will is there. That's amazing to hear that, you know, Sri Lanka is not alone and the international communities are there to help us as well. Now, coming back to the Better Work program, Simran, I think you're the best person to talk about this. Bringing it here to Sri Lanka, what can we expect from this program? Right. Um, so tools over two decades, uh, tried and tested in many, many countries. And these are tools that I think uh, go back to my initial uh, points, that when it comes to the safety and health aspect that needs to be improved, I think that is something that it can bring. How can we make uh, the industry safer and healthier place, including on the mental health and psychosocial well-being side of things. Um, the second is the area where there hasn't been enough space and opportunity for the kind of dialogue that needs to take place, the negotiations between workers uh, and employers, and, and to come up with solutions collectively. So the better work will help enable that kind of space uh, created so that those negotiations on difficult world of work matters, maybe starting with OSH, safety and health, uh, which everyone wants to make sure whether you're an employer or an employee you want to be safe and healthy right um, so starting with that but also other issues whether it's wages working time you name it uh, those are the types of issues that uh, can that space has been created for that and then uh, thirdly also seeing how we can bring in the micro and small enterprise medium enterprises into this fold so their standards are also improved, their productivity is improved, they're more competitive, and how they can just build this industry to be a much larger, more sustainable, socially uh, aware and, and rewarding, uh, job-rich, remember I said uh, job-rich and uh, human-centered kind of recovery that we'd be looking for. So I really think that the Better Work program uh, can bring many of those things. And very importantly, they have such, uh, we have a great uh, experience when it comes to promoting gender equality. Uh, and, and non-discrimination. So I think uh, together with IFC, there's uh, gender equality uh, programs that have been implemented, Bangladesh, Vietnam, you name it. And, and I think there's a lot of replicability and um, possibility here uh, to, to change that around. So uh, that's the Better Work program. And we're really excited about uh, Sri Lanka finally being a part of the Better Work global program uh, of the ILO. Thank you for that. I think we are, unfortunately, we are running out of time as well and we are reaching the end of our program itself. Before we end, is there any words of encouragement to our citizens out there from the international community, from EU and from the Netherlands, uh, so that we can take away a small message that you would like to share? Well, I, I think that the message is clear that, that there are challenges, but that we feel that there are a lot of opportunities. And if these opportunities are seized and, 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 and used well, um, uh, I think there, there, there could be a bright future, but currently, of course, the, the, the situation is, is very challenging. Um, and in that sense, just to say a few words on the Better Work Programme, because I'm a huge fan on, of the Better Work Programme, um, and the Netherlands is also supporting it uh, in, in different ways, um, but we are a strong supporter. Um, there is one of these opportunities is also in the fact that you, that you look at this from a multi-stakeholder 
um, perspective. And that's what the what better what ILO, ILO does, what better work does. Um, it's the government, the employers, and the trade unions or the employees um, represented by the trade unions and workers' organizations. Um, and I would like to even go beyond that and say we also have to take on board NGOs, we also have to take on board research and academy and financial institutions, um, consumers, let's not forget that. And that's my last encouraging remark. Um, Denise, my colleague, already mentioned it, but um, um, in Europe, I said the demand is for, for, for sustainably and responsibly sourced uh, garments uh, is going up. But um, uh, the European Union is also preparing um, legislation uh, on responsible business conduct, which will set higher standards for, uh, for instance, uh, apparel being important in the European Union. So it was all mentioned, but just to sum up, if Sri Lanka can man manage to have this standard as the, 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 the normal, the, the new normal, um, then you don't have to work with audits. Then you can just say, you know, garment from Sri Lanka has this standard and, um, uh, you know, buy, buy from us. <laughs> All right, then, uh, Ambassador Dennis, do you have anything to say on our final note? If, if there's time. <laughs> of course, yes. Uh, no, I'll, I will just go back to quality. I think that after the pandemic and, you know, with the environmental challenges that we had, sustainability means that you want less but of better quality. And that's why I think Sri Lanka is ideally positioned to take advantage of the future. It just has to now focus on how to implement this journey towards better quality. All right, then I think we'll have to end the program from there. Again, thank you very much. It's, I'm happy to know that you know the EU and the Netherlands and of course the ILO is there for Sri Lanka in order to help them build back better and become more resilient and competitive in this uh, apparel industry as well. And we were in discussion with Ambassador Tanya from the Netherlands, Ambassador Dennis from the European Union, and also Simrin, who is the country director of the ILO. And that was our episode on the special presentation. Just in case you couldn't watch us on air, you can always watch on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Stay safe and have a good night.